What if the Separatists won the Clone Wars? These are the Separatists. They were the reason that the Clone Wars ended up happening. They were a ragtag group of systems that felt disenfranchised by the bureaucratic mess that the Galactic Republic had become, and they sought to establish their own government that would actually represent their needs. If Order 66 had not been executed, and Anakin hadn't been there to slaughter the corporate Separatist leaders, there might have been a very real chance at winning the war for the Separatists and gaining independence from the Republic. However, as we all know, that isn't what happened. But what if it did? That's the situation we'll be exploring today. Our story takes us to planets ranging from the galactic core to the outer regions of the galaxy, and I can tell you for a fact that there will be some unexpected alterations to the main timeline. So without further ado, let's jump into how things would change for the Star Wars story if the Separatists won the Clone Wars. Our story begins with Count Dooku, who begins to question his loyalty to Palpatine. Dooku comes to the realization that eventually, Palpatine is just going to replace him with a new, younger apprentice who could better help him carry out his twisted vision for the galaxy. Dooku also knows that Palpatine is far too powerful to overthrow him directly. So, instead of attempting to kill Palpatine with hard power, Dooku goes for a more political angle instead. He puts his sights towards Palpatine's opposition in the Senate, knowing that there are many senators who want to end the Clone Wars. Dooku ends up handing an anonymous tip to the office of Senator Amidala, someone who is vehemently opposed to Palpatine's war and who wields significant influence in the Senate. The next day, Padme brings this evidence forward to her colleagues and absolutely shocks them with her revelations. She demands an immediate inquiry be held into these claims that the office of the Supreme Chancellor be investigated. What happens next? How does this continue to unfold on the galactic scale? While Padme requests an inquiry in the Senate, many of Palpatine's opponents go a step further. They issue a vote of no confidence in the Supreme Chancellor. The Senate is enraged, voting for the removal of Palpatine from his position of power and immediate incarceration until a proper trial can be held. Palpatine accepts his fate, still trying to save face to the public and make himself appear sympathetic and a victim of slander. In his place, the Senate elects Bail Organa to hold the position of interim chancellor until the war is complete. Because of Palpatine's actions, more systems lose faith in the Republic system of governance. Some of the neutral systems begin to join the Separatists, and Republic citizens start to protest. Some are in favor of Palpatine's arrest, whereas others believe that he was wrongfully imprisoned. These protesters clash on Coruscant in front of the Senate building, sparking galaxy-wide news coverage. Bale attempts to reason with many of them, but they refuse to listen. Dooku, being the political opportunist that he is, capitalizes on this situation. He uses his political savvy to convince more planetary leaders to join his cause, and tells Grievous to capture key worlds in the Republic that are embroiled in chaos from protesters. The Separatists gain significant ground, backing the Republic into a corner. Dooku becomes the popular voice of reason, and a beacon of hope throughout the galaxy, whereas Bale looks like an old, out-of-touch senator who doesn't understand the plight of his citizens. Despite being imprisoned, Palpatine still has significant influence throughout the galaxy. Dooku knows this, and he knows that he's just pissed off the most powerful man in the modern era. So, Dooku becomes paranoid, believing that Palpatine will end up sending people to kill him. Dooku has droid guards stand watch at all hours of the day, and he begins to lose sleep for fear that his former master is hunting him. As Dooku continues to descend further into paranoia, he realizes that enlisting the help of another one of Palpatine's enemies would alleviate some of his concerns. Dooku gets in touch with Mother Talzin, requesting that the Knight Sisters protect him from the wrath of Sidious. Because the Sisters also see Palpatine as a threat to their order, and because they had been in conflict with him in the past, they agree to help Dooku. Talzin sends some of her most elite warriors to Dooku's palace on Sereno in order to protect him. They cloak themselves with dark magic and are undetectable to the naked eye. A non-force user would not be able to see them. Dooku is satisfied with this arrangement and begins to sleep easier, knowing that anyone Palpatine sent for him would have a hell of a time dealing with the Night Sisters. Dooku wouldn't have to wait long for an attack, but it didn't come from who he expected it to. Instead, a small section of clone commandos infiltrates his palace and makes their way towards his chambers. They were on special assignment from the new chancellor himself to kill Dooku so that this war could finally end. They make it through the layer of droid defenses that the Count had set up easily, but they didn't expect what would come at them next. The Night Sister Guards attack them from the shadows, enveloping them in their green force magic and putting them into a calm, docile trance before they finish off their prey 
The Count awakes to sounds of the soft patter of the sisters moving quietly back into their positions, resuming their posts on guard duty. Dooku is incredibly impressed, thanking them for their protection. They continue to stay with him for the rest of the war. Dooku keeps his protectors close, and he changes his strategy. As the Republic begins to regroup, Bail Organa poses a peace treaty to the Separatists. Dooku, still wanting to capture more of their territory, decries this to their parliament. He slams the laughable attempt to subdue the Separatists while they were winning the war, and he states that the Separatists need to do more to liberate their brothers and sisters on other planets from the firm hand of Republic rule. Dooku states that the Separatists will not relent and that he is met with applause from his base in the Separatist Parliament. Dooku commands Grievous to push closer towards the core, causing more chaos within Republic Loyalist worlds. The Trade Federation ships block trade routes to Kamino and launch a naval attack on the world, cutting off its supply lines to the Republic. Because the Republic is running short on funds and resources, they are unable to break through these blockades. The Separatists strangle their military supply lines, intent on crushing the remaining Republic forces that were still fighting. Now, Dooku would accept nothing less than absolute victory, which he eventually achieves. Bail and the Republic Senators surrender, reluctantly granting control of the galaxy to the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Much like when the Rebel Alliance overthrows the Empire, Dooku allows a small Republic remnant to remain in the core. However, the Separatists take Coruscant as their own, and force the Republic to give up control of their military to the Confederacy. The Republic remnant is more of a vassal state for Dooku's new government, and is still headed by Bail. Over the next few months, the Confederacy begins to change many laws and regulations in the galaxy. Dooku is still lobbied heavily by his corporate council, so one of the first things that his government does is pass a bill that removes unfair taxes, tariffs, and regulations from trade routes on planets in the Outer Rim. There's an increased emphasis on industrialization, which generates significant amounts of work for those who lost their jobs after the war. Many clones actually end up appreciating the new Confederacy government because they're treated well by Veterans Affairs offices across the galaxy. Dooku may not have supported the clones during the war, but he knew that they had been valuable resources and that they continue to benefit the galaxy, unlike Palpatine's empire in the main timeline. The clones become the backbone behind this new workforce, and many of them go on to serve as officers in the Confederacy military. However, other than clones, a significant amount of these workers are droids, which ends up agitating both those in droids' rights movement sectors and their old Republic labor unions that wanted to keep jobs for organics. Some negative policies were implemented by the Confederacy as well. Unions were permitted to be squashed by the corporations, and they were done so viciously. Free market enthusiasts also advocate for slavery to be legal under their new system, especially the Zygerians. The corporate monopolies are established and maintained across the galaxy with the justification that the free market approach was freer than the way the Republic had run things. As for the Jedi, Dooku ends up not having to do much about them. The galaxy turns its public opinion on them after their poor management of the Republic military during the war that led to the fall of the Republic. Many Jedi end up questioning their beliefs following the war, and plenty are also ravaged by PTSD. Lots of them either lose their connection to the Force, go into hiding to reevaluate their core principles, or end up fighting in small resistant groups against the Separatists. Some Jedi end up becoming refugees that live in the Republic Remnant, protected by Bail Organa's government from any Separatist incursions. Because the Republic isn't causing any problems, the Separatists leave them be in this regard, warning them not to harbor any of the Jedi terrorists that had been identified by the Confederacy's intelligence. Naturally, Anakin is one of those vivacious rebels, still wanting to remain in the fight and have some adventure. Padme doesn't approve of all of Anakin's antics, but indulges the behavior because she knows that he needed a little bit of excitement in his life. Anakin and Padme also make their relationship a little bit more public now that the Jedi Order has fractured, and nobody cares that the two of them are together. Rex joins Anakin in many of his missions into the Separatist space. As the months progress, cracks begin to show within the Confederacy's government. As the corporations continue to dominate the political sphere, a disparity between planets begins to arise. The haves and the have-nots are more pronounced, and despite an overall increase in productivity, inequality is worsened. Worlds that are neglected or abused by the big companies begin to rally together and petition for more rights, some of which even evolve into full-scale revolts against their corporate overlords. They aren't interested in ousting the Confederacy, only in gaining more individual autonomy from the galactic monopolies. Some of these small revolutions end up succeeding, 
leading the corporate council and other lobbyists to worry. They push for increased military funding within the Confederacy, along with more legislation that pushes stability and their solidification as the only companies in the Confederacy with the ability to do anything. The Separatist Parliament votes to ratify these proposed bills, especially since many of them were in the pockets of these big companies. Protests break out across the galaxy, and because of the new legislation, organizations like the Trade Federation and the Corporate Alliance are able to crack down on dissent. These crackdowns only prompt more dissent, and the Confederacy descends into civil war. The Republic remnant officially remains neutral in the conflict, but senators like Mon Mothma and Padme covertly fund select cells that are fighting against the Confederacy's corporate authorities. More and more systems declare their independence from the Confederacy, either joining the new galactic factions or considering themselves loyalists to the Republic of old, launching their renewed support behind Bail Organa. Hey folks, if you're enjoying this story, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications as we update this channel weekly with new What If content. Now. Back to the story. Organa becomes more vocal about the conflict as well, saying that perhaps the Confederacy wasn't as powerful as people had once believed. His words inspire people within the Republic to take up arms and join the battle against the Confederacy. Tuku's government is in shambles, so he does something drastic. He begins to say no to the lobbyists in his government. Tuku issues an executive order purging all of the lobbyists and corporate shills from his advisory board. He also decides that a corruption inquiry within the ranks of those in his parliament was required because he didn't want his movement to collapse into what the Republic had once been. Without Palpatine, Dooku is a pretty solid leader who has a clear vision for what he wants the galaxy to be. It's just the corporate leaders had gotten their fingers up in his business, molding his idealistic view into a perversion with them in control. This symbolic act shows a lot to the people of the galaxy. What's left of the Confederacy ends up revitalizing itself, focusing on providing more aid to the planets that were left under Dooku's governance. While there's still a corporate presence, obviously, their political say is drastically reduced, especially after the corruption inquiries indict many of Dooku's parliamentarians. New blood is elected, and new laws are put in place that limit both lobbying and political funding. This allows for the views of the general population to be better represented, and for more complete democracy to come to fruition. Dooku visits neighboring factions and tries to once again convince them of his government's validity. He asks for a second chance, showing what his parliament had done to reform themselves. Many of these factions end up joining him, believing that Dooku could provide them with a sense of safety from the endless war that had engulfed the galaxy. More systems flock to Dooku, even those with some elements of corporate interference. The Confederacy can't avoid war forever though. Some of the smaller factions say no to the Confederacy, attempting to take their smaller planets on the outskirts of Separatist space. The Republic Remnant is also dealing with these attacks, but it remains strong with renewed support from some systems that chose to leave Dooku's Confederacy. The Republic Remnant was growing once again to be a dominant force in the galaxy. Bale's leadership is respected by many, and despite being a pacifist, he knows that a strong military is required to protect the Republic from these splinter governments and criminal organizations. Bale sees that Dooku is going through a similar situation, and he has an interesting idea. Bale actually reaches out to the Count and asks for a military alliance between the Republic Remnant and the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Surprisingly, the Separatist Parliament agrees with this proposal. They would like to have extra support, and they still maintain significant trade relations with the Republic Remnant, despite disagreeing on many political issues. It seemed like this agreement would be beneficial for both parties. And this is where the true battle for the fates of the galaxy would begin. With the two major militaries of the galaxy joining forces, the smaller factions don't stand a chance against them. Their militaries are crushed by General Grievous, Admiral Trench, and many former Jedi generals who had signed up to help fight for the Republic Remnant when they saw war starting to break out again. Dooku is pleased to see his old comrades such as Mace Windu and Yoda prosper in the galactic theater of war. He ends up hosting many of them on Raxus for old time's sake, still respecting them despite their opposing views on the Force. Dooku starts to return a little bit to the light, but he remains firm in his dark side use. He's a classy man, but he was prideful. Joining the Jedi again was just something that he could not do. More and more planets surrender to this joint military alliance, unable to withstand the combined might of these two powers. The Republic Remnant and the Confederacy finally end up achieving some semblance of galactic peace once again. The Republic Remnant and the Confederacy of Independent Systems sign a treaty that allows for both of them to maintain their respective governments. Coruscant is made into a neutral world for both factions, allowing for their delegates and politicians to peacefully interact in the galactic center. 
This also pleases the corporations, who have a place where they can officially do business with both the Republic and the Confederacy. While the two big powers defeated many smaller factions, they learn from their lessons in the Clone Wars and give them regional autonomy. Neither wants a repeat of the Clone Wars and the death and destruction that ensued. Both governments promise not to touch these smaller factions, provided that they are never attacked again. The smaller factions all agree, happy to have their own degree of sovereignty in the greater galaxy. How does this grand galactic conflict then finally conclude? Dooku steps down as the Confederacy's leader, ready for retirement, prompting the election of Needham Bonteri as the new Separatist head of state. Bail Organa also steps down as Chancellor, and Mon Mothma ends up being elected. She promotes Padme to be her Vice-Chancellor, knowing that this will be a popular move with the progressive members of the Republic. Both of these governments make peace and solidify solid trade ties. They both understand that they will disagree, but can be good neighbors to one another. Meanwhile, the old Chancellor of the Republic, Palpatine, still sits in his cell, watching all of this transpire. He never received a full trial due to the chaos that had enveloped the galaxy, and he had waited patiently to make his next move. Now was his time to pounce. Peace had been established, and it was time for Palpatine to stir up some chaos. He records a message of himself on one of the holonet connected devices in the prison, and pays off one of the guards to distribute it for him. This message claims that he'd been a political prisoner of the Republic for years, and he'd been held unjustly without trial. This creates waves across the galaxy. Palpatine smirks as he senses reactions from across the galaxy and from angry citizens who had once supported him. He knows that now he would be able to strike. Peace may have been achieved. Palpatine, however, a man of the dark side and eternal coveter of power, was determined to change that.